Hey guys, folks, this is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. So proud to be with you today. Do you know that if, you're ha if you are going to heaven when you die, you have to be what is called S-A-V-E-D. What is that? That is saved. S-A-V-E-D is saved. Saved for what? For eternity. To be with God in an everlasting forever. Be with God forever. Now, if you're going to be with God forever, you have got to have asked Him to forgive you of your sins, come into your heart, and save your soul. Uh, Luke 1 and 47 says, My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Now, I had a spirit, <laughs> excuse me, that did not rejoice in God. I had a spirit that only rejoiced in other spirits, the spirits of alcohol and drinking and smoking and all of the things of the world. That was my spirit in 1972 before I asked Jesus to save me. And after he, I asked him to save me, now I have the Spirit of God in me. And it's God that gives me what I need to know that I'm going to heaven. And so, being justified freely by His grace. Wow. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth, a propitiation. That means He took my place. By His blood that He shed on the cross, through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness. Wow. Wow. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. All the sin of the world that were previously committed. That was in all of the Old Testament. Do you know that when Jesus got off the cross and raised and walked through the height of the earth, he went to paradise, forgave all of those in paradise of all the sins they had ever committed do you know their sins were only covered by they were covered by the blood of bulls and goats and because they were only covered they weren't right they were just covered but God wiped them away Romans 3 24 and 25 I just read that scripture Psalm 106 and 8 in the Old Testament has the same redeeming story. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. God saved the whole land of Israel, all the children of Israel out of Egypt. Out of 400 years of bondage, he saved them and reworked with them. Now, in that day, in the Old Testament day, the law just covered the, almost like a physical thing. And we have so much physical failure. We cannot on our own uh, physically serve God without the Holy Spirit coming and making it to where we can serve God. The Holy Spirit's the one that has to do it. God did. He, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might believe. He did not condemn it. He didn't send him in the world to condemn the world. He sent him in the world that the world might be saved by him. And by that power which God gave his son, to, uh, the power of redemption, John 3, 17. Uh, John 6, 47. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, he who believes in me, wow, man, can you, can you say that? He who believes in me, wow, has everlasting life. <laughs> wow. Hey, what is believing? Believing means that you act upon it. Say, if I believe that God would have me get on the YouTube and do some excerpts, then I act upon it. 
I, I do what I believe. I believe if God said he'd do, he would honor these, then I'm doing them. When, I don't know, and who, I don't know they're going to be too. John 3.36 He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Wow. What is the wrath of God? The wrath of God is the eternal. It's the eternal thing. It's eternal. It is the place, the, the wrath of God is the place of hell. The abode of the devil and his fallen angels. That is the wrath of God. And that's where you will spend eternity if you do not repent from your sin and say, God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. Otherwise, you spend eternity in the wrath of God in a place called hell. For by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, have you been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Wow. I can't boast of, in the pride of myself what I did. I can only boast in Jesus that he came at 3 o'clock in the morning, November 5th, 1972, and said to me, you need to get right. If you don't, I'm not going to save you. You're going to have to get right. And, and God saved me and made, it, made me right. In his eyes, in his, through his, the blood of his son that was shed for me, made me where I could go to heaven and be redeemed from the wicked life that I was living. And that's what I absolutely had to do. Let's look at Titus 3, 5 and 6. Not by works of righteousness, uh, which we had done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Wow. Through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. When he was on the cross, nobody killed him. He poured his blood out for you and I. He said, well, somebody pierced him. They did. He didn't have to bleed. He only bled because he chose to bleed. He was God in the flesh. He didn't have to bleed. He didn't want. Matter of fact, that blood that he carried was the blood for the redemption of this world. A special blood. Not a blood like you and I have but a pure blood, a blood that had no sin, none. When one drop of blood touched this earth, there was an earthquake. When one drop of blood was shed, there was, and we went into total darkness. We went into total darkness when God sent his son, when his son died on the cross for three hours. There was total darkness on this earth. It was, there was no other blood ever shed on this earth like that blood. Uh, probably the closest to any that ever came was Abel. When Abel uh, was killed by Cain, his brother, and he was a righteous man. Abel was a righteous man. <coughs> he was so righteous that his blood cried out from the earth to God. And God said to Cain, he said, Your brother's blood doth cry out to me from the earth. And so, We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son as Savior of the world. John 4.4 1 4. John 4.4 4. We've seen that. I saw it. How did I see it? I saw it by faith. I asked him to forgive me of my sins, come in my heart and save me by faith. And now I testify that he did send his son to save the world. That if you confess, Romans 10, 9, with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's a promise. Romans 10, 9 is a promise to you and I if we'll believe it. Luke, Luke 19, 10, listen to this. For my son, for the Son of Man hath come 
to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came for one reason, one reason only. To seek and save that which was lost. Why am I left here? I am left here for a reason. What is that reason? The reason I'm left here is so that I will win other souls that could come to be with Jesus. That's my duty. I have a duty now. And what is my duty? And that's to live circumspectly to God so that others can be saved. And not too many uh, uh, hours from right now, I will be out in the world. And, and as I go out into the world, my duty is, is to carry some tracks in my pocket, which I do, to uh, open up to people during the day and say, hey, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? And ask Jesus to come into your heart, and you will. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, oh, thank the Lord for his mercy. If it wasn't for God's mercy, I would not be here, and you would not be here. Because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ by grace for his, for it, his grace, his grace. Oh, what a word, grace. If you could stretch it out around the world, grace. Grace is what says to the little child that uh, got, got a glass of milk and he knocks it over. And, and mama, mama says to him, that's all right, baby, I'll clean it up. And she mops it up, cleans it up, and gives him another glass of milk. That's grace. Now God's grace took the sin that we had, wiped it away so that we don't have to die and go to hell, and gave us what we need, which is live life with grace. Wow. And His mercy. Wow. His mercy. Everlasting life He gave us. Second Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, anyone, anyone, that's anyone, <laughs> that's the worst sinner on this earth. And I was one of them. I was one of the worst sinners on this earth. And anyone, he said, that was me. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you know I asked Jesus at 3 o'clock in the morning, 1972, to do away with all of the old things that I did and had done? And he did instantly. Instantly, instantly, they were gone. Instantly, he did away with them. And they were gone. And I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, Jesus, who is he now? Now, he is my Lord. Wow, we've gone from Savior to Lord. Listen to Romans 10, 9, and 10. I read it a few minutes ago as the saving force now I'm going to read it as the Lord, as the Lord of my life. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we have to make that confession unto salvation. Once we make it, then we have that salvation. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2.36, Peter was saying to uh, 70 different dialects of people and different people, this Christ, the one you just crucified, you scribes, you Pharisees, you people, you just crucified this man. And he was the Savior of the world. He was the Son of God. And you crucified him. Romans 14 a, For if we live, we live to the Lord. 
And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Wow. Once you ask Jesus to save you, you become the Lord's child. He is interested in you uh, 24 sevens. He's interested in you 365 days a year, every second, every minute. And he's interested in you serving him. For if we live, we live to the Lord. Romans 14, 8. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So it's in the Lord. Everything is in the Lord. Who is your Lord? Is God your Lord? Or are the things of this world your Lord that will leave you destitute and in a bad place throughout your life? For the Lord God will help me, therefore, I will be, I will not be, I will not be a disgrace. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Isaiah 50 and 7. Are you ashamed this morning? Are you ashamed this afternoon? Are you ashamed this evening? Are you ashamed this day that you are, are not living the way you should live with the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do not be ashamed. You do not have to be ashamed. You can have communion with God 24 sevens. When you go to bed at night, you can have communion with God. When you wake up during the night, you have communion with God. When you leave the house and you're driving down the road, you have communion with God. This is Psalm 73, 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. That's morning, noon, and night. That's all day long. That's any time, any time, any place, anywhere, and all the time. Blessed is the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits. We're talking about daily. There is a prayer that I pray every morning. And it goes, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, Lord, our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We need to say that prayer every day. God taught 12 grown disciples, 12 grown men, how to pray that prayer. And that's a daily prayer to get us going so that we have communion with God throughout the day with him. Wow. Blessed be the Lord who daily, daily, that is Psalm 68, 17, daily, wow, loads us up. I mean, hey, listen to this. When you say he loads us up, he loads us up with benefits. The first benefit is we escape, we have escaped damnation, we have escaped uh, the curse of God. We have him on our side. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the thousand hills. If we care to walk over any one of those hills, we can safely walk over those hills among his cattle and be in the place that he would have us be. Mark twelve thirty. listen to this. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. A-L-L, -L, all of your heart, with all of your soul, showing us that we have two different entities in this body. We have the heart and we have the soul. And with all of your mind, the third entity, body, soul, and spirit. We are triune. We are body, soul, and spirit. And with all of your strength. Now, what is your strength? Your strength's what God gave you, the power of mind, the power of heart, the power of physical movement, 
the power that every bit of the strength, my little fingers, second, third, fourth, fifth, my thumbs, all my hand, my joints, all my body that's fitly together, that I should serve God with it and not man. I should serve God and not man. To get up and go to work and do what God would have me do. And you know what he says? This is the first commandment. The first commandment after salvation is that we dedicate all, A-L-L, -L, of our body to God. When I first got saved, God delivered me instantly from alcohol. Delivered me instantly from cussing. But then a thing came along called pride. A thing came along called self, which was in me, which caused me to continue to do some things God would not have me do. See, I continued to smoke. And yet I continued to say God saved me from everything of the world, yet I continued to smoke. Which was a displeasure to God. It was a displeasure to God for me to continue to smoke. So he had to show me I couldn't keep doing that and say that I was serving him all the way because I hadn't given him everything that I should have. Listen to this one. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, I love that. When you see that word, therefore, that means because, because Jesus did what he did, we should do this. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, listen to this, those in heaven, that's in heaven where God is, that every knee should bow. And those on the earth, wow. And, listen to this, those under the earth, that is all that have gone on before us that are buried in the earth, that every knee should bow. Wow. Wow. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you know that every knee that went to hell is now confessing in hell that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh? That he was the Father come to the earth? And that they had denied him and now they're not denying him? Yet, even though they're not denying him, they can't be saved because they have eternal death. If you go to hell, it's eternal. Never. Never. Anyway, there's no purgatory. There is no purgatory. You cannot pray the soul of a loved one out of hell. If he died or she died and went to hell, they are there for eternity, forever. Never. Not ever. Not ever having the opportunity again to receive the grace of God and escape that wicked place. You have to be alive and ask Jesus personally to forgive you of your sin and come in your heart and save your soul to escape hell forever. Luke 6, 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Do you know we have to be very careful that we do not confess the Lord with our mouth and do opposite actions unto the Lord? Jesus is not only our Lord, he is our love. He loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, he died on the cross for us. And because he died for us on the cross, you're going to have to forgive me, my camera is acting up. And um, I, I have no idea what to do about it. My, my um, computer is ready for a new one. This one is playing out on me. So, God gave me this one and he'll give me another one. <laughs> he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. 
and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. When does God manifest his self to me? Uh, just before I came to where I am where this machine is and sat down here, God woke me up and said, uh, you need to get up and go do a couple of excerpts on the uh, computer and so that we'll have them for eternity in the future. You say, Brother Peter, you mean what you're doing right here is for eternity. Every single solitary thing we do is either for gain in eternity or for loss in eternity. So we need to think about that. Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Diligently. We need to seek God diligently. All the forlornness of people today. I am probably speaking to thousands and thousands of people today who are forlorn. Who they're forlorn. They, they do not have uh, any hope for today. They're going to get up. And their hope is not there. And they're miserable. And they're in a deep, dark abyss. They're in a place of uh, depression. Why? Because they can't get Jesus on the scene. Listen, if you give him your whole heart, he'll fill it. He will fill your heart. He will fill your head with light. You do not have to live in a great dark abyss of depression. You can come out of that. As of late, God has had me help. Five or six people that I'm working with, I find out they have what today they call clinical depression. And they treat it with medicine. I got news for you. God is the medicine that you need to treat your depression with. Did I live a depressed life before I was saved? I used to not think that was a depressed life I lived, but it was. I had to get up in the morning and sw swill a beer down, good, get a good drink of liquor and through the day, get a good shot of liquor in me, and keep going 24 sevens, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, keep going with a little liquor, a little shot of alcohol, a little shot of the spirit of the world, and to keep me from getting into a totally depressed mood. And so the devil has not got an answer for you. Only God has an answer for you. He's the only one can get you out of where you are. Let's look at a Jeremiah 31 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Wow. God's loved us with everlasting love. Isn't that something? The best thing we could ever possibly have. And listen to John. 1 John 4, 16 through 19. And we have known and believed the love that God hath for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. And God in him. We love him because he first loved us. Wow. Isn't that something? Now, but God demonstrated his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Rome 5 and 8, Christ died for us while we were yet a sinner. One more scripture, and we're going to call it good on this little excerpt, half hour we're supposed to have here. And we're going to go quickly. The Lord will command his love, his kindness in the daytime, in the night, and his song shall be with me. Psalm 42, 8. To know the love of Christ which patheth knowledge uh, that we may be filled with all fullness of God. Ephesians. 
I, I, I will betroth you to me forever. We are married to God forever. I will betroth you to me in my righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. Hosea 2, 19. And now abide faith, hope, love, and these three, but the greatest is love. 1 Corinthians 13. Listen to this. John 15, 9 through 17. For the Father loves me, also have I loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Jesus, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that you may joy and may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that, uh, than to lay down one's life for his friends. These things I command you, that you love one another. What he's saying, do you have a friend who is not saved? Are you praying for that friend? Are you laying your life down for that friend? Would you say that on Thursday, on Thursday this week, I'm not going to eat dinner on Thursday of this week. I'm going to fast one meal for one of my friends and pray for him during that meal time. So you knock off for dinner at your work, you go sit in your car or go sit wherever it is you normally eat, and you open your Bible up and you read and you pray for this friend. This is what he's saying, laying down your life for this friend. Lay down your life for a friend. How do you do that? You give yourself to fasting and prayer and a time for that friend and pray for him. Especially your lost friends. All of us have friends who are not going to heaven. Who are going to die and go to hell if, if, something, if God doesn't come on the scene and do something for him. Have you got some friend that you need somebody to help you pray for? Find somebody that can help you. We went in our little study this morning, so far in our 32 minutes here, we have gone from love, the love of God, the salvation of God, the mercy of God. Now God has given me and will give to you peace. Peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This is where the world is today. We're in a place today where there's no peace. There is no peace. People are in a muddle. They're in this depressed mode, and there is no peace. The Lord will give strength to his people the Lord will bless his people with peace. Wow. Psalm 29, 11. Philippians 4 and 9. These things, these things, which ye learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. There is some doing. There is some doing in this life. We can't just sit by and do nothing and expect this peace to fall on us. We've got to follow what God has us follow. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, man, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is our mediator. When you pray, pray in Jesus' name. Pray in Jesus' name. You've got to pray in, from your heart in Jesus' name. And pray that God would uh, be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, 
uh, 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, for everything by prayer and supplication, thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known. Wow. Uh, to God and peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Man will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Wow. Your minds, your mind and your heart, they are joined together. Center, right here, frontal lobe, center of your mind. Joins your two left and right banks of your mind together, right here, into one place. And that's supposed to be serving God and you'll be of one mind, not double-minded, not helter-skelter, not here and there, but the all in one place. Ah, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Because I trust in God, he will keep my mind on a perfect place. Isaiah 26 and 3. Psalm 4 and 8. I will both lie down in peace. And by the way, I do that. I lie down every night in peace. And sleep. <laughs> For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. I don't have to be frightened. It's not like when I hang my hand off the bed to think some a rattlesnake's going to come out from under the bed and bite my fingers. I don't have to worry about the devil. I can go to bed and sleep. I'm on this YouTube right now. I have no idea what time it is right now. It's something. But God has given me more rest or enough rest that I needed in a couple of three hours so that I could get up. And, and go to work and do what God would have me do. If you should happen to be watching this, this is a, a blessing for you to be able to hear these verses put together so you could glean from them. You need to re-look at this, take your pen, a pad, write down all these verses, look at them for yourself, look them up in the Bible, Go through these Bible. This this little thing I'm doing right here today goes from Genesis to Revelation. It goes through the whole Old Testament all the way through the New Testament from the beginning to the end. Colossians 3, 15. Listen to this. Let the peace of God rule in your heart to which also you were called in one body mm, and be thankful one body in God not a divided mind but one mind in one body Wow Isaiah 9 6 and 7 for unto us God gave his son a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment, with justice from the time forward, even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Do you know what our big problem is, my friend? You know what our big problem is? We, we're, we're so finite-minded. We think because we live in the United States and we have a government in the United States that this is something. I got news for you. God's got a government that governs the whole world. It, yeah, you say, well, I live in, in Britain. We have a British parliament. Well, I live in, uh, in, in Africa, and we have a, a uh, uh, apartheid, or whatever it is. And, and you say, well I, well, I live in France, and we have the French 
uh, system that runs this government. Well, we live in Italy and we have this uh, I Italian thing. And so because you live all over the world. If you're not careful, you think that your place that you live is what the world is. And that's not what the world is. When God has the whole world in his hand, he's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole wide world in his hand. He's got this whole wide world in his hand. He's got you and me, brother, in his hand. He's got you and me, sister, in his hand. He's got the whole wide world in his hand. It's not just the place where you and I stand. It's not just the place where you and I dwell in the country we dwell in. He's got the whole world. Every single solitary person who has said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save me, is my brother and sister. I don't have to speak that language. In January, we're going back down to uh, Costa Rica. I don't speak a bit of that language. But I can side up with those people who do. And I can agree spiritually with them. My question is, is, is the zeal of the Lord of host will perform this in you. Let's read this again, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, which was Jesus Christ. There, listen, no historian can deny the fact that Jesus was came and born in the flesh. No historian can deny the fact that this was something that never happened before and never happened again, that there was a star that came over this place in Bethlehem where Jesus was, cannot be denied by any of the world-famous scientists. None of them can deny that. And they can't deny the stories that others saw that and came. The only child that was ever born that a group of magi came, brought gold and frankincense and myrrh to this child and gave it to him as he was born. There, are no, there is no other setting uh, in this world from the creation of this world to today whereby a Savior came other than Jesus Christ. He was the Savior. He was it. You can uh, go by all of the other things that you want to, other religions you want to, but they're not going to take you to the same place. There is only one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ, who can get you to the Father God. And through His name and His shed blood only can you come to the Father God. Ephesians 2.14 For He Himself, is our peace, who had made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition. There was a great wall of petition between mankind and God. Where did that wall start? It started with the disobedience of Adam that believed the lie and got damned because of it. So because of that, now forgiveness had to come into the world. And this forgiveness, Psalm 103 and 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed the transgression from us. God moved the transgressor that I was and the transgression that I did for 30 years. God moved it as far as the east is from the west. How far east could you go before you'd be going west? And how far west could you be go before you were going east? The two do not meet. They are a complete circle that cannot be depleted. You can go east until you can't go east anymore, and that would be forever. <laughs> so... Uh, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sin and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. <laughs> wow. I got relieved. I, you know that from November 5th, 1972 at 3 o'clock in the morning, I have never had to drown my sorrows in alcohol again. I used to drown them every day in order to live with myself for years. In order to live with myself, I had to get drunk all the time, stay drunk. Otherwise, I had to face myself and I was a thief and a robber and a crook and a liar and a cheat and a, a whole monger and I was, if you name it, I was it. In order to live with me, myself, and I, I had to get drunk. And the, you, listen, and there are many of you that have had to do the same. And now God has delivered you. And if you are watching this and God hasn't delivered you yet, you need to ask Him to deliver you from every bit of that stuff. And He will. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. He'll cast them into the sea of forgetfulness if you'll ask Him to. To never more to be remembered. I love that scripture. I use it all the time for my own self that the devil can come up and say, why are you heathen? You used to do this, you used to do that. That's a used to. That's gone. God forgave me of that. It is no longer in my past. Do people come up and say, I remember when you were so-and-so. I said, well, God delivered me from that memory. <laughs> I'm not going to bring it up and hammer God with it. He cast into sea of forgetfulness. Never want to be remembered. Now, I'm now a new creature. I am now a new person. I am not that old man anymore. I am a new man, and you can be a new person. Uh, listen to this. Colossians 3.13 Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do so. Forgive them. Listen, you cannot harbor anything against anybody at any time. Yeah, but you say, but 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 Peter, you don't know what you don't know what they did to me. Oh, you don't know what they did to me. Well, what did you do to Jesus? You were part of the people that put him on the cross. We, we had that nature that put Jesus on the cross. And that was what put him on the cross. Listen to Mark uh, uh, 11.25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Are you going to say, well, I ain't going to forgive that rascal? Well, did God say to you, I ain't going to forgive that rascal? You're a rascal too when it comes to God. If you've got some unforgiving thing against somebody, you are a rascal. And you are outside of God's will. And until you forgive them, that can hinder you to where you're worthless the way you can't be used. We've got to do different. Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be like scarlet. Oh, wow. They shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What he's saying is the sins that we did and the sins that we may do will be under the crimson blood of Jesus Christ. And the scarlet blood will turn them white as wool. And they will be uh, made clean. They will go from black 
to white through the red blood of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 1.18. Isaiah 43.25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake. Wow. And I will not remember your sins. Man. Isaiah 43.25. God himself saying, to an unworthy generation, I will not remember your sins. Wow. The wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man in his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 5, 5-7 through seven, says that God pays attention to our thoughts. He knows the number of every hair on our head. He knows our thoughts. He knows our thinking pattern. He knows when we are totally in communion with Him and when we have broke that communion by lustful thoughts or thinking thoughts that do not belong in our head. Therefore, if anyone in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, A-L-L, all, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 All of that old life that I was got passed away and I got a new life. All things in my life became new. And it was called the righteousness of God. So when you come to the righteousness of God, let's look in Philippians 3 and 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of which is from God by faith. That's the only way you can come to God is in pure righteousness, and that's by faith, and there will be not, there will not be one speck, not even a speck of unrighteousness in heaven. None. God is pure light. Darkness cannot penetrate light. When you go to heaven, you will not go with one speck of unrighteousness on you. They dross will be burned off from you by the eyes of Jesus Christ there, so as they were fire. Pure righteousness is pure fire. Pure fire burns all, A-L-L, the dross off. The best that we can do in the world, it seems, is 999. 999%. But that last percent, we can't seem to get it out. We can't seem to get the 100% pure. And you can uh, do silver seven times. Heat it to the, and rake the dross off it seven times. And you can get 999 out of it. You can heat it eight times, but you're still only going to have nine, nine, nine. You are never going to get 100% pure. And on this earth, you're not going to do that. The only one that can get 100% pure is God. And that's it. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, Jesus Christ, to all and all who believe, for there is no difference. God didn't give us 100% righteousness through His Son. He came. Did you know that not? For 33 years, Jesus walked on this earth and not one speck, not a speck of unrighteousness touched Him. Or did He touch? Not a speck. That when he went through the uh, torment of the devil, 
And the devil took him here, took him there. God allowed the devil to take the flesh and the body of Jesus and take him over to a mountaintop pinnacle and, and to speak to him rudely. And Jesus never brought a railing accusation against the devil. He never sinned. He never said anything. He had a love even for the devil, even though the devil was wicked. The devil could not be turned around, though. Uh, Romans 8 and 10 says, And if in Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Our spirit is the life that came into this body. And this body houses the spirit of God. And we are to fall in. 1 Corinthians 1.30 but of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and satisfaction and redemption. Whew. Boy, that word redemption, to redeem, to redeem, to buy back. That's what redemption is. We have been bought back out of the hand of the devil. We have been brought back into righteousness. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I said not one drop of sin ever touched Jesus Christ in his 33 years. But on the cross, when he shed that blood, he took for three hours the sin of the world upon him bodily and sent it back. He was the funnel that funneled that sin back into hell. All the sin that ever had been on the earth, ever was on the earth during his life, and ever would be from then on forever. He took all of that sin funneled it into hell. And the only way a person can die in that sin is it has to be resurrected from hell, from the devil, into that person. And then that person does not say, Jesus, I am a sinner, deliver me from this. And he dies and he goes to hell and he lives in hell forever with that punishment and that sin because he has not confessed. The Bible said, confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. And that's what salvation is. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when you say, I am a sinner, forgive me of my sin, immediately you have a new, new, new life, a new change. But to him who does not work, but believes on him, who's justified the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Look at Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, the law could not do it, and that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. How do you mean that, Brother Peter? How did he come in the likeness of sinful flesh? He came in a body. On account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteous might be, uh, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I'm still walking in a fleshly body, but I'm walking after the Spirit of God. And therefore, I'm covered by God through the Spirit that His Son left behind, the Holy Spirit, has covered me. Wow. To work the work of righteousness, which will be peace. The effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance. <laughs> I have quietness and assurance in my soul, in my body, in my mind, in my heart. I can get up in the morning, whatever time, with quietness 
I can go to bed at night with quietness. Why? Jesus Christ came into my body, my spirit, and my soul by asking him to and saved me and gave me that. Goodbye.